Last year, Emma Cortland was nominated for a Best Host Award at the Ambies, the Podcast Academy's glitter-showered ode to the podcast industry, its attempt to remake the Oscars. For Emma, that was a particularly appropriate award ceremony. Before moving into podcasts at Wondery and Spotify's Gimlet, the host of Crime Show spent seven years working at the Motion Picture Academy of Arts and Sciences, home of the original red carpet. Emma didn't win last year. That award went to one of the biggest names in podcasting, Sam Sanders. But just one listen to Emma's fascinating crime show, and you instantly know why the Podcast Academy nominated her. Her delivery, which is intelligent, a bit distanced, but warm, and that elusive ability to write and voice an audio movie, that story we watch unfold in our heads. Along with her curiosity about how to ethically tell larger stories that happen to have a crime at their center. We are delving into cinematic storytelling today with Emma Portland on Sound Judgment, where we investigate just what it takes to become a beloved podcast host by pulling apart one episode at a time together. I'm Elaine Appleton Grant. Emma, I'm so excited to have you here. I'm so excited to be here. That was such a nice introduction. Oh, well, I meant every word of it. And it was just so fun, too, because I was, frankly, looking back at your CV. And listeners should know Emma and I know each other um, for a few years, actually. Mm -hmm. But I was looking at your CV that I never really looked at. And I was like, wow, you did some really fascinating stuff at the Academy. That job at the Academy was not intended to be um a seven year journey it was just like oh i you know i started i started in the theater because i had worked at the movie theater on my college campus and i had no idea what i wanted to do so this just felt like a really it felt like a really natural thing to do watch movies for free just like make sure that people don't fall in the aisles great um and from there i just sort of got plucked up and brought into the science and technology council's film programming Team. Wait a minute, who gets plucked up from like selling popcorn to, I mean, is that what you were doing? Like you were an usher or no, something? No, there was no popcorn. There is no food at the Academy's Theater. But no, uh, you just check people in. It, it's a membership organization. So you just check in the members. You know, occasionally there are big events that are open to the public. But um, it's a it's a delightful It's a delightful little gig if you can get it. I was still fascinated by the fact that you worked at the Academy and you did a lot of you did a lot of programming around horror movies, which I thought was an interesting background to do a crime show. I was doing sci tech programming. Genre films are the kinds of films that have, you know, you look at Academy Award nominees from every year and the movies that get Best Picture nominations are are of an ilk, you know, war movies, like whatever. And the technical awards are genre movies so frequently. Star Trek, Lord of the Rings, like those are the movies, uh, um, like American Werewolf in London, those are the movies that'll be nominated in tech categories. So almost all my programming. That's such a funny connection. I never even thought about that. Yeah, but I love, I also love genre storytelling, which is, again, totally accidental. It's all totally accidental. But it makes sense. I mean, so much of our careers are accidental. And then you look back at the threads or somebody else looks back at those threads, as I did, and (laughs) notices them. So yeah, it was fun. Let me uh, get to, though, why Mm. we're really here. (laughs) So what I like to do when I start episodes, start interviews, Mm -hmm. the whole process starts with I'm inviting somebody on and then saying, tell me either a show you loved or a show that was very challenging to make. And in this case, you told me about one episode that met both of those criteria. You love this episode, but it was very challenging to make. That is Paging Dr. Barnes. Mm -hmm. Paging Dr. Barnes is a mind-blowing story about a guy who pretended quite successfully to be a doctor for decades. I want to talk about how you introduce this piece because Mm -hmm. I listened to it when it first came out. So that was uh, September 2021. And the first time I listened, I didn't know the backstory of what had happened at your shop among your team. And I loved it. It was great. But the second time I listened, which was quite recently, my jaw literally dropped because the 
introduction is so beautiful. And now I understand why you, what went into it. Yeah. Like this introduction makes so much sense with the reason you did this. And we're going to talk about it after I play it. So here is the introduction to this particular episode, Paging Dr. Barnes. To anyone who knows Steve Barnes, it should come as no surprise that one of his earliest memories, and certainly his most vivid memory, is the day that his dad, Gerald, first introduced him to baseball. He took me to my first game. I wasn't even two years old. And he carried me through the tunnel at Wrigley Field. And I remember seeing how beautiful and green it was at not even two years old. I have that memory planted in my mind 60-something years later where I, I could tell you exactly what it looked at. It was the most beautiful, lush, gorgeous thing I ever saw in my life. It wasn't just the beauty of the field that seared that day into Steve's memory. It was the fact that that beauty had been shared with him by his dad. So here's what you had told me. Yeah. You said you almost scrapped this story of this guy who pretended to be a doctor, that it just wasn't working. So tell me that story. What was the story you thought you were going to tell? And why didn't it work? Well, my producer, Mitch, has an amazing sense of like turns, how a story unfolds. And the scene that he'd imagined as the cold open was the scene where this guy comes into the hospital, this clinic in Southern California. He walks in and he's experiencing these symptoms. He's, um, he's cold all the time. He's like insatiably hungry. He is insatiably thirsty and he doesn't know what's wrong with him. This one day in December 1979, Rick had the day off. A man named John McKenzie had come into the clinic for medical attention. He was 29 years old and recently divorced, and he said he was feeling strange. He told Dr. Burns that he felt dizzy. He said he was constantly thirsty, constantly hungry, and no matter how much he ate or drank, the feeling wouldn't go away. He also said he was losing weight and peeing all the time. Dr. Barnes told McKenzie he was suffering from a benign positional vertigo, the diagnostic equivalent of nothing to worry about. Still, Barnes drew some blood, prescribed some anti-dizziness medication, and sent McKenzie on his way. But the next day, when the blood work came back, Dr. Barnes was out of the office. So the paperwork on McKenzie was handed to Rick to review. According to the report, John McKenzie had a glucose level of nearly 1,200. Normal is 80 to 110. Over 10 times the norm. And his list of symptoms? Peeing a lot and insatiable thirst? First-year medical students know what diabetes is and what their presenting complaints are, okay? John McKenzie was on the verge of a diabetic coma. That scared me to death. So I said, we need to get hold of this guy and get him back in here. Rick ran to reception, pulled McKenzie's file, and called all of his emergency contacts. When no one got back, Rick decided to call the cops. The cops showed up to McKenzie's place, and when no one came to the door, they kicked it down. And in the kitchen, they found John McKenzie's body. He lay dead on the floor. In his hand was a bottle of pills for dizziness prescribed by Dr. Barnes. This is how we originally thought that the story was going to begin. And it's a really powerful scene. I mean, it makes sense that you would think that. Absolutely. The problem was that we were following this guy who does, like, you know, Dr. Barnes gets discovered, blah, blah, blah. And later he'll have another run-in with Dr. Barnes where he is once again the guy to reveal Dr. Barnes. There is no change in this person, this physician assistant, who we thought that we were going to follow. There is no change in him. And also, to him, Dr. Barnes is a little bit of a two-dimensional character. Because when you have a serial crime, somebody commits a crime over and over again, especially the same crime over and over again, you're like, what is going on with that person? Right. And that's the real question. And it's something that this person, this physician assistant could not engage with because he didn't know him really. I mean, like, you know, they worked together for, for a couple months really. So that story felt flat. It felt like it wasn't actually a story. There was no journey for this guy to go on. It was a series of like discoveries. So there are three story registers, right? So there's external, internal, and philosophical. 
These are the three dimensions of storytelling. A great story will touch on all three of them. Good stories touch on two, and bad stories touch on are just one. Um, usually, true crime lives in the space of external. And external is, explain that. It's what happened. It's a detailing of what happened from, from a distance, right? It's like usually crime stories are told from investigators. But they can only begin to wrestle with like what it feels like to be a participant in this, right? Like they can only sort of engage with that. They can tell us a little bit about what it means sometimes. You know, that's the philosophical component. Internal is what our show always tried to deliver as well. And we ended up getting that from someone else. Some, and that changed our story. And listening to that thing that we were all feeling that this is – that this feels hollow, this feels like we don't have that internal thing and we could have that internal register, that, that's what made the story. And that's why we, we start with this baseball tip. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what you told me was that you literally almost just killed the story after yeah. you'd presumably spent probably months working on it. We were definitely on this for, for months, but um, we had done two drafts of the story with the physician assistant as our primary story mule. Story mule is the person, it's, that's the phrase that we use for the person that we are following through, through the arc of the story. And it was just so, um, it just felt empty. Mm. And so at first you, you thought, we just don't have a story here, we're going to have to kill it. But then you came to the conclusion that there was a story here, and the story comes from the point of view of this con artist's son, Steve. And Steve is the guy who you just heard in the introduction to this story, in, in the introduction to the episode, saying, I remember my first memory. I wasn't even two years old going to Wrigley Field. Yeah. Tell me what was going on in your team that took you on this little, you know, narrative arc of your own. Oh, no, we have a we have a story that's not going to work. We're just going to throw it out to wait a minute. There's something different happening here. Well, I mean, you know, part of this is necessity and part of it is just like that. I think that we all felt that there was magic to to this guy, Steve. We had started interviewing Steve. Steve had had a front row seat to the whole journey. And the whole idea behind interviewing Steve was just so that we could like bring some humanity to this, to this figure of Dr. Barnes who had always felt so far away. And we had so many questions about his motivations. And we, we'd reached out to Steve partly as due diligence, but also partly because we were so curious about like how he felt and what he saw and what he thought. So he was going to be this side character who was going to help us answer the question of, but who really is Dr. Barnes? That's how we had intended to use him. Uh -huh. But after we'd laid everything out and our primary story mule felt so hollow, we were just like, let's try this. We didn't have a scene. We always like to begin on a scene and we didn't have a scene with Steve. But once we looked at what was there, there was really just a moment of like trusting that what we had found was special and actually listening to what was in the tape. Mm -hmm. And that's where we found baseball. Well, I thought it was really beautiful. And like I said, when I understood that the first story, the one you almost mm -hmm. threw out, was about a con artist and about his crimes. Mm -hmm. But that this story is about the relationship and it really is, is just beautiful all the way through and, and highs and lows. Yeah. Then when I listened to that introduction, I was like, ah, oh, this is, this is pretty magical. So what you do is you go from, you know, basically his memories and Steve really idolized his father and then you pose the turn to the whole story, this mm -hmm. setup. And I want to play this for everybody. Okay. So Steve grabs the newspaper. I go to into the stall and, you know, I'm reading the newspaper while I'm doing my business. He's taking his time, flipping through pages. And that's when Steve sees this article. 
about my dad being arrested. Dr. Gerald Barnes had been arrested at the Irvine Clinic, where for three years he'd worked as a physician and then as medical director. I felt like someone just absolutely came into the bathroom stall and went wham and gave me a really hard gut punch. It knocked the air out of me like I was in a daze. Do you remember what parts of the article stood out to you most? Yeah, my dad's in jail. (laughs) That's pretty simple. (laughs) And just the, the sheer blindsided fraud of it all. I was blindsided. Again and again, over the next 25 years, the articles, the fraud, and that blindsided feeling would repeat in sequence, like the steps in some tragic dance, until only one thing was clear. Steve had no idea who his father really was. And that turned out to be the mystery, right? That was really the peg that you hang the entire episode on, is this very confused relationship. Who is my father? In a much bigger way than most of us have to ask that question. And I think that you don't, when you are at a distance from this, right? Like you think like, why would this guy do this? Like that is the driving question, like from, like from the outside, right? Like when we're on the outside, we're looking at this and we can be like, why is this happening? What's he doing? What's going on with this guy? But ultimately, like when you are on the internal register, who is he is is really the driving question, because it says something about who am I like, who are we? What does this have to do with like, how does this affect our relationship? And it really took us listening to our tape to to figure that out. Planning is so important. Having a skeleton, having a pre-visualization of what you want your story to be and then being willing to to actually listen, listen to what people are telling you. Like there is a story that has been reported and then there is the story that it has been lived. And, and oftentimes, you know, this, I think this came out like in the nineties, like early nineties that the story was primarily being reported. Steve had not had an occasion to talk about this, you know, publicly since then. And The magic of hindsight is so incredible because more than anything, the details were were like wishy-washy. He didn't remember what happened on this time that it happened or that time. But like he had this clarity of hindsight where he really knew what the whole thing meant to him and he really knew how he felt about it. Also, talking to sources who have been in therapy, who have done a lot of processing – is one of the most beautiful things there is. This guy, Steve, like he doesn't really talk in terms of psychology. He talks relationally. He was so, he was so plugged into how he felt about stuff and it was really beautiful. And that's a remarkable thing to find. And it's, it's a little bit rare. Did you have all of the tape you needed? Or once you, once you made the decision, did you then go back to Steve for more? No. We had everything. And in part because it wasn't our primary interview, we like the baseball stuff. Yeah. Sports becomes a huge through line in the story. And I hadn't written any questions about sports. I hadn't written like, you know, I had there were so many questions that I had asked of Steve that were warm up questions that we used. Almost everything you hear here in the cold open was a warm up question. Tell me what the warm-up question was. Oh, so when somebody's agreed to do an interview with us, they've been pre-interviewed. Like, we know mostly the beats of their story. We at least know generally that they can deliver the beats of their story. I don't know the contours of them. That's the thing that I'll be looking for. But they know that they're going to be asked to sit down with a stranger, someone they've never they've never spoken to, and talk about what is probably the worst experience of their life. And... You can't just jump into that. You cannot just ask people to do that cold. And also, it's not the style of interviewing that I was trained in, right? So um, so sometimes I'll ask these kinds of warm-up questions. This is a very oral history warm-up question, but I'll ask, like, um, tell me the story of how you got your name. It's one of my favorite ones. It is a great question to start with because it is very specific, Mm -hmm. but it also allows them to take that 
question wherever they go. Usually what ends up happening is people will tell you a little bit about their parents and you can gauge from what they tell you how you can learn so much about somebody. Also, you can like learn about like ethnic history, their relationship to ethnicity. Like you can learn about like relationship to your parents' relationship to, um, to like, it, it just, there's, there's so much that can be learned from, from that question. That's a great question. I have never heard of that as a warm up question. Tell me how you got your name. No, tell me the no. story of how you got your name. The story of how you got your name. Sorry. Yeah. And, and there's a difference. I know the difference, but you tell me the difference. The difference is, tell me how you got your name. It's like, oh, my mom chose it. Mm -hmm. Tell me the story of how you got your name is asking is asking to narrativize something, right? Just like what just happened. You might not register the difference in repeating it, but there is something to being, tell me the story of whatever. Like, tell me about the moment that something happened. There is a signal there that says, like, this is your time don't don't think that this is boring. Like, this is actually what I'm asking for. You know what I mean? I think a lot of people are trained to dismiss their own stories as being boring, like especially stories about everyday things like your name. Like, mm -hmm. that's boring. Why would you want to hear about that? Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. I asked. Like, I've, 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 I've like extended you an invitation to tell me a story right out of the gate. And sometimes it backfires and somebody ends up wanting to tell you like 15 minutes of family history. <laughs> but I'm game as long as it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell me a couple of others. Yeah, I, I think that for him, I wanted some early memories. Not that I thought I was going to use them. Right. So, so you ask, what's your first memory? No, I didn't ask what was your first memory. Like just like tell me about like what you remember from your childhood with your dad. Like, like things that you remember f about being – young. The Wrigley Field, I never thought in a million years that we were going to use that. There would be no place for that. But I listened to it and you hear his voice and he's like, it's, he's like the grass at Wrigley Field. It's the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen. And you can picture it and you can feel the thing he's feeling and you can feel being small, being on the shoulders of someone who is like, who is so much bigger than you and coming through the like this dark tunnel and opening up onto this light and this like absolutely explosive kind of like overwhelming green. The significance of that is something that you can feel whether you love baseball or, or have zero interest in baseball. Like you understand that this is like, this is like being a temple. This is like being a church for people. You can feel that entering a stadium. What he describes as a religious experience and what ends up happening you see is like that's their church. They go together. And that is where they have their most meaningful conversations. It's the focal point of their relationship. Steve remembers this one time. We're at Dodger Stadium. We're having a great time. You know, we're buying each other beers and enjoying the ball game and everything. And I look at him and I go, so you doing anything illegal again? Oh, no, promise. I'm not. Da, 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 da. Not long after. Steve found out that Gerald was, in fact, up to his old tricks again. Another piece that I use in this is like, he tried to teach me how to run. And so I would go out there and he's like, you run like your mother. You know, cute things like that that tell you so much about this relationship and so much about, so much about Dr. Barnes. That's internal. That's the internal. And it becomes much more of a character study. Yeah. Like you said, you're seeing somebody change over time. And we mm -hmm. definitely see Steve, the son, change dramatically over time. Yeah. And yet, like most lives, it's not like just a smooth arc. You start here and you wind up there. Yeah. It's more there's ups and downs along the way. There's big change and there's small change and it goes back and forth. Yeah. As in a real life, it's very emotionally textured, this story. Mm -hmm. And also, I loved hearing you describe, you know, what the baseball wound up meaning to you yeah. as well as to him, because mm -hmm. you described it in such cinematic terms, which, of course, is where I sort of started from, is that this is very much this piece, such a movie in my head. And, and I have a question about that. So yeah. I think that we producers listen to shows in very different ways than most listeners do, mm -hmm. because we know sort of the architecture, the kind of stuff that you're talking about right now, and the pre-interviews and the setup and the storyboarding and the 
just, you know, headaches and mm -hmm. thinking that go into making a story. But once it's made, it sounds easy. Yeah. And one of the least understood pain points is that most of us are not natural born storytellers. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many times I've heard a great story in my head and then the, the source or the guest is a terrible storyteller and you get mm -hmm. horrible tape and you, you just can't do it, right? Mm -hmm. So Steve is amazing, but I am betting that you helped to some degree and, or maybe not. There are people who are that good, but I'm, yeah. you know, he describes just in that one clip we listened to that it was like, you know, somebody punched him. He got the mm -hmm. wind knocked out of him. That's a very sensory detail. Did you help Steve along the way? Did you say, what did it feel like at different points? Yeah, of course. But, you know, there's, uh, yeah, this is like, this is compiled in the cold open. There is tape from the beginning of our conversation, the middle of our conversation, the end of our conversation. There is tape from all over the place. That's a strategic thing. I always feel like um, a lot of times you need a second take of a story. You are listening to someone tell a story and they don't actually use um, – they've told you who they're talking about like five minutes ago, but like they didn't say, my dad did this or, you know, whatever the hell. There's a lot of pronouns. There's a lot of he and people also are not very faithful to when they change the person they're talking about. They're still using – he? Yeah. And you get lost? Yeah. I generally think that people are good storytellers. Like narrative is the primary mode of human cognition. We are telling ourselves stories. That's how we define identity. You know, this is what it is to be a human being is to live in a world of narrative and to, and to experience the world through narrative that is being revised constantly. I think that what happens is that as we revise it, we can, we can like sort of bend our story like like we change our story it's changes we that story gets changed as we go through our lives and sometimes those changes interrupt the flow of the story also mm -hmm. i it, i have adhd and i recognize it in other people when there's an abundance of enthusiasm and you are in the middle of a story and then another thought comes right in and you're like and the thing about that is without finishing your first sentence, that happens all the time. And really, it's just like my job is to be there. And a lot of times, almost always, I had a producer with me in interviews. So between the two of us, we are listening to figure out, did we actually get the moment that we thought we got? So with Steve, Steve is, Steve is sitting on the toilet, which, oh my God, the fact that I was able to get a toilet moment. Like at the very beginning of this very heartwarming story it was such a delight for me. Um, but he's sitting on the toilet. He's reading the newspaper. He reads a story about his dad. And he's at, he's at Dodger Stadium. He's at Dodger Stadium. Working. Yeah. He's yeah. at Dodger Stadium. He reads a story about his dad. We don't know what the story says, but he's like hit with a feeling. And I think Steve was the one who said, I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. I think he said that. But I had to unpack that. And so he, later on, he says something about the sheer blindsided fraud of it all. We needed that. Because a gut punch can be so many things. And so to understand specifically what is underneath that feeling, like that's where we get really get um, the humanity is in the specificity of that feeling that, it, that we all know. There's the universal thing and then there's the really specific thing. You brought up something I was going to ask you about. Mm -hmm. You are an oral historian with a master's from Columbia. Yeah. I'm curious. Tell me like one technique that you used for creating this story or doing interviews for this story that is unlike something a journalist is trained to do. What's the difference? Well, in audio journalism, I don't know how much difference there is, but I'm not the story ever, which is not like not a signature of journalism, but it's definitely different from traditional print journalism where I'm not just looking for the facts. I'm looking to tell a story and I'm looking for the meaning of the story for the person, which the meaning of the story for them, that is not something that journalists are supposed to be very concerned about. You make the meaning. You get the facts of what happened, and then you decide, you lay them out, and you decide what that means. 
we have a pilot episode that is about um, there's a, a little girl who supposedly dies in a fire. But there is a question of like, what happened? Was very underexamined by the police and the fire department. And I remember somebody raising a flag about racism. This is a Puerto Rican family that like the reason that they didn't do more to investigate what happened with this fire was because was because they they didn't care about this family. These lives were not high priority. And that may be true. But I had talked to the family. And, you know, race and class are in this country are like very are very interconnected. But I asked specifically about race. And to them, this this was about the value, the monetary value of their lives. This was a, also a poor family. And this was what it meant to them. They were like, our lives didn't matter in terms of dollars and cents. And that's the answer I fucking went with because I'm not going to tell you, I'm not going to look at your experience, especially your trauma. And if you don't think that it's that like the core of this is racism and the story isn't about infrastructure, isn't about like racist systems, why would I do that? This is about like what this moment meant for you. And I think that I, I feel the same way about, about Steve. I could have someone assess what's going on with Dr. Barnes, like what was motivating him, whatever. That's almost less interesting to me than, than what Steve thinks is going on and how Steve feels. That's the oral historian approach is like, it is inviting your subjects into the meaning making. I love that. I love that. It comes through. It absolutely comes Thank through. And I think that's the part of the, what makes this very special and very different than other true crime, other just yeah. plain narrative shows, really. Um, so you mentioned the question of race and ethnicity and class, which is a big deal in true crime reporting. Yeah. A lot of questions around the ethics of true crime reporting. Mm -hmm. And you are Latina. Mm -hmm. And you had some feelings about being a Latina podcaster and how people use their identity or not um, as podcasters. Tell me Tell me what you feel about that. Well, um, well, I'm Mexican, but I'm also Jewish. And I think that like that's the thing that informs that informs so much of the work, right? Is that like it's like sort of like two realities existing at the same time. Um, I don't speak Spanish well at all. I can understand much more than I can speak, but I wasn't raised by my Mexican father. And um, and as much as like Mexico and Mexican culture was very present in my life as a child. I think that being multi-ethnic more informs my perspective on the world than anything else. And because of that, I feel like I can perform my identities. I can show up. I can show up more Jewish. I can show up more Mexican in any one moment. In the true crime space, a lot of hosts choose to show up as themselves and to drive stories forward with an I, with a capital I. It is their journey. It is their point of view. And that, that I feel like that is a very reporter, a very journalistic move, or it's like, or it's an untrained move, right? Where it's just like, you haven't spoken to anyone and you've only done very surface research. And so, you know, that you're not an expert in anything. So, you know, so all you can give is just like your gut feelings about something. It's a visceral reaction, which is totally valid, but it's just like not schooled. I very purposely don't do those things. When I use an I, I do it very intentionally. I do, I do, it, I do it almost never. And it's always a point of like a big discussion. And part of that is because a lot of these stories have an undercurrent of advocacy. It's true crime, and I, that's such a, it's such a funny, strange, big umbrella. But one of the things about in the genre that's really dirty is the sense that like it really tends to have very binary, black and white. Right and wrong. Right and wrong. And I do think that um, that by holding back my identity – by holding back myself, I am better able to drive empathy. And when you get to hear from the people who've experienced something, especially if they've done something bad or if they're telling you that they love somebody who did something bad, and you can say that's a bad thing to do and still feel 
for that person. That's, that's the whole goal. I, I sometimes think that leading with yourself, leading with your politics, leading with your point of view robs your listener of the opportunity to, to get there on their own. But it's a complicated question because I suspect that the show would be more popular if I were more saleable, if I made myself more of a brand. But I suspect that it would undermine the goals of the show, which are to drive empathy, which are to like allow people to walk down roads that they would not otherwise walk down, to sort of trouble the lines between good and bad, to really live in that sense of gray. I do think that being multi-ethnic allows me to live in multiple spaces and like inhabit different perspectives in a way that's just built into the way that I walk through the world. I love that. Thanks. I love that. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, that's really nice. Um, tell me about a scene that was not in the original script, the one that you scrapped, but that's in this one and that you really love. Oh, I mean... Steve Barnes, his dad gets arrested, and I'm like, tell me about the first time you went to go see your dad in prison. His dad has been locked up for the first time, and, and it's, you know, this is like, this is like a nice Jewish family. You know, this is like, you know, they don't, they don't know people who are in jail, right? So they're like, they're like, this is a very strange experience. So what, is, what does Steve do for his dad? He stopped by a local Jewish deli and bought some of his dad's favorite foods. Security at the prison was minimal, so they'd actually be able to eat together and talk. So that was the next time I saw him. I asked him, you know, oh, what's going on? And he goes, well, you know, I kind of made a mistake. And, you know, um... And that was more or less the end of it. And then, after serving 18 months in a California penitentiary, Gerald Barnes was released in January of 1983. It was a new year, a new start. It was just such an endearing thing. Again, nobody reports that part of the story. Nobody's like, and then his son went to the deli and he got and he got cold cuts. He got his hand sliced corned beef. No, that's like that's not anywhere. But those are the moments that he really remembered. And those are the moments that that stuck with me because they felt so human. Mm -hmm. Like what strange circumstances, but some things just like tradition, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and also I think it makes it so three-dimensional. It's like yeah. you can imagine this this journey. This guy's really nervous. He's going to see his father in prison, Yeah, I, which is crazy. And so he goes into a comfortable place and he picks up this very real specific stuff, you know, and, and you can picture them sitting down at the prison. We are just about out of time. And yeah. so um, I have, I have, a couple big questions yeah. for you. What's your philosophy of true crime? We tell stories for a, pur for a purpose. One of the reasons it's so hard to make the show is because we don't say yes to every story. There are really good yarns that don't actually lead anywhere, that don't amount to something that feels educational. One of the things in our secret sauce is like, what does this mean, though? It needs to mean something, especially if, if people get injured, if people are hurt. I don't know why we'd be talking about that if it didn't mean something. What does this story about Dr. Barnes in the end mean? What did you decide it meant? We have the meaning for Steve, which is like the one that's the most tangible, right? But then there is this other thing, and that is about the American medical system and and the California Medical Board. There's this burning question through through most of the story, which is, how does he keep getting away with this? How does how do people keep hiring him? Isn't anyone checking his references? And the answer to that question says something. You know, we found the answer to that question, and that says something about the American medical system. What we're actually looking at in all of these things is that we have all of these systems that are designed to keep us safe that like provide so many guardrails and a lot of them have like really major loopholes and they aren't really doing the thing that we hope they would do. Um, it's always really nice when you can say that that loophole got closed, but I will tell you that when we talked to the California medical board, I didn't feel like it fully had been like, I didn't feel like they had made me feel more. I, I definitely feel, 
I felt a little bit more comfortable about it, um, but uh, but not much. <laughs> yeah. Um, lightning round question. Yeah. What do you know about hosting now that you wish you had known when you started? I listened to like my audition tape essentially the other day, and I remember thinking that I wanted to sound like one of the NPR people. This is how Ira would do it. Like you listen to it and that's a little bit what it sounds like. I'm, ac- I'm actually, I'm not doing me. I'm doing an impression of someone that sounds, um, that sounds like they know what they're doing. It's been a process of learning to sound like myself. And that doesn't happen immediately for everybody. I, I didn't know that this would be a long journey of figuring out what I sound like. And, and also trying to unlearn a lot of the things that I had adopted vocally that were just attempts to be taken seriously, you know? Oh, there's a lot to unpack there. Who would your dream guest for Sound Judgment be? Oh, my gosh. Oh, I mean, Avery Treffelman is like the, I mean, she's the bee's knees. Um, She was one of the 99% Invisible producers, but then she made a show called Articles of Interest, which was a spinoff series of just her own in the style of their show about clothing. Then she made Nice Try Utopia, which was hugely lauded. And then she became the host of The Cut for a stint. I'll keep an eye out. I'm (laughs) keeping a running list. Emma, thank you for thank this you. very thoughtful approach to to the work and be, being willing to unpack it with me. It's fascinating. You're so welcome. It's been fun. At the end of every episode, I give you just a few of the many takeaways from these conversations. Here are a few from today. I'll put many more in the show notes. Number one. There are three story registers or dimensions, external, philosophical, and internal. A great story has all three. A good story has two and a bad story, only one. The internal story, that's the hardest one to get, but the one that's often what makes the richest, most memorable story. We kind of get inside our protagonist's head and their heart. Number two. The warm-up question has come a long way from the sound check question, what did you have for breakfast? If you've ever been in a radio or a voiceover studio, you've heard that one. A great warm-up question from Emma is, tell me the story of your name. Three, it's important to use the word story when you ask questions like that. As Emma says, we human beings tend to dismiss our own stories as boring or unimportant. By asking someone to tell you the story of their name or the story of something else, you are extending an invitation and saying, no, it is important. I really want to know you. Thanks for listening to Sound Judgment. Please take a moment to rate and review us on your listening app. And better yet, share the show with a friend personally or on social media. Tag us with the hashtag Sound Judgment Podcast. We need your help to grow this brand new show. Every single one of you matters. Have you subscribed to Sound Judgment, the newsletter? It's full of great hosting wisdom from all of our guests, and it's really fun. It's fun to write. Head over to podcastallies.com to subscribe. Sound Judgment is produced by me, Elaine Appleton-Grant. Sound designed by Andrew Perella. Our gorgeous cover art is by Sarah Edgel. And project management and all the things by the inimitable Tina Bessier. See you soon.